Amen, friends. Open up your Bibles this morning with me. Matthew chapter 28. It is particularly exciting for me this morning to be preaching from Matthew chapter 28, not just because it's Easter and this is a resurrection text and so it's appropriate, but because this is the last chapter of Matthew and we are finishing the book of Matthew. This was my scripture journal that looked new when we started and now as you can see it's a little rough around the edges. We've been in Matthew, this will be our 57th sermon in Matthew. So we've been in Matthew since 2022. Praise the Lord. What a good journey it's been. And so it is particularly special and encouraging for my heart to preach from Matthew 28 this morning. And I pray that the Lord strengthens us all through this text. You may notice on the screen the sermon title this morning is Impossible Mission Force. I couldn't resist. You may wonder what the heck that has to do with our text. And I would ask you, what is it that makes the Mission Impossible movies and TV show so compelling? In these stories, there is an impossible mission, right? It's in the name, Impossible Mission Force. There's an impossible task that needs to be done. And only this certain group of special individuals, extraordinary people, can accomplish this mission. And through the course of every movie or every episode of the TV show, somehow it all comes together and it's mission accomplished, even though the mission was impossible. And we love stuff like that with high stakes, right? The best stories are not easy wins. There's nothing exciting about he was all powerful and then smote his enemies and there we go, right? This, this is kind of a boring story. But it's really exciting when it's like it, the deck was stacked against them and through these un unlikely circumstances, they arose victorious. Those are, the, those are the kind of stories we enjoy reading and thinking about and watching and listening to. The Mission Impossible movies are particularly compelling because an, a, an impossible mission accomplished testifies something about the nature of the people accomplishing it, right? In this case... It's that Tom Cruise will always get it done. But in the case of our sermon text this morning, it's something slightly different, but not too dissimilar. This is almost the argument of our sermon that an impossible mission accomplished testifies to extraordinary people. It's almost. Before we get to the argument itself, though, I want to point out something about the structure. This is a resurrection text. This is Resurrection Sunday. And so we think this should be about the resurrection, right? But notice what Matthew does not do in writing his gospel. He doesn't end it with, and Jesus rose, and there it was. Right? He actually goes on to show us something, that the resurrection itself launches, if you will, a mission. The gospel doesn't end with resurrection. Rather, it moves forward into mission. This is why Luke wrote Luke part two, right? What we know of as Acts. Because the resurrection itself launches mission. This text is full of mission movement. We'll notice as you read the, the women moving around in mission, the soldiers moving around in mission, the disciples being commissioned by the risen Jesus. See, the resurrection, which we celebrate on Easter, is a call to action. It's a call to do what Jesus says in verse 19, make disciples, right? Right? But it's not a call to do this impossible mission through extraordinary means, extraordinary people, special gadgets, those kind of things. It's a call, actually, to accomplish this mission through ordinary means. That brings us to the argument of the sermon this morning. Here is the argument in a nutshell. An impossible mission accomplished through ordinary means testifies to our extraordinary king. That's what we see in this text this morning. An impossible mission accomplished through ordinary means testifies to our extraordinary king. We accomplish the mission we've been given to do through ordinary means precisely because we serve an extraordinary king, a king who is risen and reigns. That's the outline as well of the sermon. An impossible mission, ordinary means, and an extraordinary king. 
Those are the three movements we're going to go through this morning. But before we get into the impossible nature of our mission, let's first read the text, Matthew 28, 1 to 20. And as I read, just listen around for those things, impossible mission, ordinary means, and extraordinary king. Matthew 28, 1 to 20. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. There was a soundtrack to this text, the suspenseful music, the uh uh-oh, music would be starting now. Verse 11, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. The first movement is the impossible mission. King Jesus gives the church an impossible mission. Why? Why would we say this mission is impossible? That's what the question I want to consider for this section. First of all, the message itself is unbelievable. We are supposed to go and proclaim King Jesus is risen and reigns. And you might, yeah, okay, people don't rise from the dead. Set that aside for a minute, though. Think about the message itself that these women had to proclaim. It's unbelievable because they have no proof. Notice what's not in the text. The angel's there, the empty tomb's there. But what's not there is anyone who saw Jesus like get up and unwrap himself and those kind of things, right? There is no actual witness to the actual resurrection. What's called for by the angel who announces the resurrection is a call to see the effects of the resurrection and to believe the testimony of others, What the women had to do is they had to look, right? The angel says, come and see the empty tomb. They see the effects. They hear the angel explain it. He's not here for he's risen just as he said he would. And they're called to believe that without having seen Jesus or without having witnessed his resurrection. Notice the disciples are called to do the same thing. The women are given a message, right? What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to go tell the disciples, go meet Jesus in Galilee. What are the disciples supposed to do? They're supposed to see the women that have seen the empty tomb, and they're supposed to hear them say, yes, Jesus is going to meet you there. We even heard him say it. And they're supposed to believe that. And then, once they go to Galilee, they see Jesus, but not before. For both the women and the disciples, faith comes before sight. 
And this message that you must believe that a man rose from the dead must be believed on faith before you can see. And that's a hard sell. This message that we're to proclaim as part of our mission is unbelievable. The messengers themselves are unimpressive. The the text starts with the two women at the tomb. This is all that's left of the church. That's a pretty lame church. These women are, there's two of them at least, so they, they follow Deuteronomic requirements for testimony, but there's, there's still women in a culture where women's testimony was not valued. It's no wonder that some of the other gospel writers record that they didn't really believe the women at first when they said they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And they're the ones who are going to take this message out. Or think about the disciples themselves. In verse 16, when the disciples arrive at Galilee, notice Matthew says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. And uh, Frederick Brunner in his commentary calls the disciples 11-ish, and I like that. They're, they're slightly hobbled. Why? Because one of them betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. And now the, the 11, are, the rest are like, eh, not really sure. Verse 17 says some doubted, right? And they're going to be commissioned to go and conquer the world with this message. Not a great plan. Anyone see another character in the story who'd be better to send? What about like verse 3? Why not send this angel who has clothes of lightning that can go and announce this thing, right? Like, why send a couple of women and 11 lame disciples? The messengers are unimpressive. The scope is unfathomable. But just all nations, guys, just go ahead, take care of it, right? They they, they couldn't even conceive of a world beyond the Mediterranean, and here they're to take this to all nations? Jesus couldn't even convince Jerusalem, right? Verse 15, the Jews continue to believe the lies of the soldiers, and the disciples, and these women are supposed to take it on beyond Jerusalem? to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, according to Acts 1. Notice as well that this mission is sharply opposed, right away. Verse 11 to 15. There's two missions in this text, right? We know this text kind of, if you've been in church, you've heard of this text as the Great Commission. But what we don't talk about a lot is the Great Counter Mission, or the Great Con, that takes place immediately after Jesus' resurrection, where the soldiers are bought off. The women are told to go and tell in verse 8 and verse 10. And the soldiers go and tell in verse 11. And then the powerful in the city, the religious leaders, give them a new message to go and tell in verse 13. This great counter mission has more respectable witnesses. The soldiers are much more believable than the women. It has a more believable message. It seems more likely to our thought that the disciples came and stole him. And it has the powerful support of the chief priests who can even persuade the governor not to execute his soldiers that fell asleep on the job, which he would normally do. So it must mean that they are loaded in terms of money. This mission is impossible because of these things. And all of these things are still true 2,000 years later. Nothing has changed. The message is still unbelievable. Right? We all know people don't rise from the dead. The witnesses are still unimpressive. Look at us, right? Look at the state of the church in America. The scope is easier to fathom, but it's still massively daunting. The Joshua Project estimates that approximately 42%, or 3.4 billion people of the world's population are still part of unreached people groups. All nations? The mission is still sharp, sharply opposed as well. A new enchantment has come over our land, though. It's not the enchantment that says, this is not the Messiah you're looking for. That was what the chief priests were trying to spread. Rather, it's the enchantment that says, what Messiah? You don't, you don't need saving from anything. You're fine just the way you are. You don't even need a savior. That's a hard 
message to oppose with the gospel. The mission has not gotten any easier. We still have an impossible mission. This is why the church is an impossible mission force. We've been sent by King Jesus to make disciples of the whole world. Now, in the TV show, the IMF got like cool gadgets and, and people that kind of, you know, help support them computer wise and stuff. What does Jesus give us to accomplish this impossible mission? Verse 19, Jesus says to make disciples, right? And he surrounds this with three means of disciple making. This is what Jesus gives us. This is the second movement in the sermon. It's an impossible mission accomplished through not tech and gadgets and, and all of this kind of stuff, but ordinary means. What's striking is how ordinary these means that Jesus gives us are. The first ordinary means in verse 19, go. There's a lot of missions misunderstanding in terms of does this mean like as you're going or that you should go or do I move across the world or is this the end of the earth and I'm already where I'm supposed to be? It's missing the point. Notice in verses 7, for example, the angel says to the women, then go quickly and tell his disciples. Or verse 10, when Jesus says, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers. Go and tell is really, go is just a shorthand for that. Go and tell. And the point is to get moving, to get to work. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go and tell. And notice that go and tell always comes after come and see. Verse 6, for example, the angel says, come and see the empty tomb. And then verse 7, go and tell the disciples, right? That's how it goes. There's this pattern, come and see and go and tell. You may have noticed as we read this text even that there's behold is repeated over and over. And seeing verbs and seeing nouns are repeated over and over and over. Matthew wants us to see something here. We come and see and then we go and tell. We testify to what we've seen. And we just do that by saying things and by living a certain way, right? We speak and live in light of reality. That's ordinary means number one, go. Ordinary means number two, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's some things that you come and see and then you go and tell someone and you're like, hey, come see this. And, and then you go and you're like, oh, cool. And then there's other things that you're like, you, you got to see this. And you see it, and it changes everything you thought you knew. That's what the come and see of the Christian gospel is like. King Jesus, risen and reigning, is the second kind. It changes everything you thought you knew. It's much more than just, oh, cool. Peter Kreeft puts it like this in his book, Christianity for Modern Pagans. He says, neutrality is impossible once you are addressed with a claim as total, as intimate, as life-changing, and as sin-threatening as Christianity. Christianity is not a hypothesis. It is a proposal of marriage. The announcement that King Jesus is risen and reigns is not a hypothesis to be thought about and dissected and maybe accepted, maybe not. You could take it or leave it. It's a proposal of marriage. And the way that you accept this proposal of marriage is through repentance and faith and you express that in baptism. Baptism is, if you will, the betrothal ceremony of that marriage. It's a symbolic, embodied action expressing repentance and faith and the reality of forgiveness in a new life. And that's all I'm going to say about it for right now because I don't want to steal Charlie's thunder for next week. More on that to come. Baptize, an ordinary means. Number three, teach, verse 20 teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Baptism is entrance into the people of God, becoming willing subjects of King Jesus. As Frederick Brunner says in his commentary, coming under new management. It's a great way to put it. And when you're under new management, you have to learn how to be a part of that people. That's what teaching is. Teaching is learning how to live under new management, just really living out the reality of our baptism. 
At the core, teaching is not about learning how to keep things mainly, but it's about learning how to keep these commandments or learning how to observe them as a, as a response, as a means of love. Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus, when he says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you, is really saying, teach them to love me. That's what we do. We together learn to love King Jesus. And all the things he has commanded that we've seen in Matthew, just think back even to the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc. All of those things are, are love worthy. They're beautiful. And they show a beautiful king. We make disciples through these ordinary means. We could sum them up this way. We make disciples through lived word and sacrament. Through lived, go, do, get to work. Word, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And sacrament, baptism and part of the Lord's commandment is the Lord's Supper. We do this all the time. These are just incredibly ordinary things, right? We go all the time and we say, hey, did you see this? Right? We do it with like boring things on our phone or memes. We're like, hey, did you see this? We don't really need to be told to do that. We're just excited about it. We want to share it. Baptism seems kind of spiritual and mystical, but if you think about it, we're interacting with water all the time. Right? We go swimming, dunk our heads under the water. We drink water. We wash with water. Teaching. We're always trying to teach one another to love something. It may not always be Jesus, but it's something. These are just ordinary things that we do. These are still the ordinary means of our mission even today. We as a church exist to be and make eternally joyful disciples of Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? Through these ordinary means, lived word and sacrament. We live in light of what's real, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And we call others to come and see that. We use ordinary things in creation in God-given ways, using bread to baptize, using water and wa uh, use, using wine rather and bread for communion. We use water to baptize. Don't baptize in bread; that'd be bad. I've Got to get that image out of my mind for a sec. <laughs> we speak God's word to one another, right? That's what we do when we gather together. This is. The things that we are doing right now are the ordinary means by which God builds his church, by which we accomplish this impossible mission. That's it. Is that really how we accomplish this impossible mission? I don't know about you, but these ordinary means feel so weak. They feel so insufficient. They work incredibly, painfully, frustratingly, slowly, It's no wonder that God's people have been tempted throughout the years to supplement or replace these things. Why wouldn't Jesus give us something better? That'd be my question. Like, like wh why not a Jesus YouTube channel? Or like, like, why couldn't there have been a news crew at the resurrection? Or I'd, I'd settle for an angel in lightning clothing? Maybe a red pill that would kind of wake us all up to the reality? Why didn't Jesus give us something like that? Why, why would Jesus allow any opposition at all to his kingdom? The one who could call on 12 legions of angels, now would be a good time, Lord, right? It's because he has something better in store for us. It's because God intends to show something in how his church wins. He intends to show that King Jesus is really risen and reigning. This is our third movement of the sermon. We serve an extraordinary king. An impossible mission accomplished through ordinary means testifies to our extraordinary king. We see this by the connection to two realities in verses 18 to 20. A proclamation and a promise that sandwich this mission. You notice in verse 19, go therefore. And the therefore connects 
the go and the make disciples to what comes before, which is verse 18, when Jesus proclaims or announces all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. King Jesus proclaims that he has all authority. In other words, he reigns. All authority is really difficult for me to grasp, at least. I assume it is for you, too. Over all spheres, heaven and earth, spiritual, invisible, and visible, powers and principalities and earthly kings, over all kingdoms, when he says, go and make disciples of all nations, that's because he rules over all kingdoms. It's in fulfillment of all Old Testament expectation. Notice where he tells the disciples to meet him. It's on a mountain, and mountains matter in the scriptures. God speaks to his people in Exodus from a mountain, commissioning them as a people to go and be a blessing to the nations. The kingdom of God is compared to an earth-filling mountain in the vision in Daniel 2 that starts out small but fills the whole earth. Jesus is the fulfillment of these expectations and so many more. This, this section is chock full of Old Testament allusions. Matthew is making the point through his fulfillment language all the way through his book that Jesus fulfills all of these. Especially here, he fulfills the vision in Daniel 7 of the one like a son of man who comes riding on the clouds and is given authority over all kingdoms and a dominion that will never, ever end. That is King Jesus. He has all authority. This means that he is worthy of worship. Right? That's the first implication of the fact that he has all authority. Verses 9 and verses 17, when people encounter him, they worship him. This is only right if he is actually God. Jesus as God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Son himself is worthy of worship. Because he himself is the source of all that is good, true, and beautiful in this world and in his church. Secondly, because Jesus has all authority and reigns, every kingdom already belongs to him. This is the most encouraging thing probably to me out of this text, is the fact that he has commissioned us to go and make disciples of all nations, and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, all authority has been given to me, so those nations are actually already mine anyway. You're just going and you're just announcing to them. You're just telling them the reality. You're waking up and you're waking others up to the truth that all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Every kingdom already belongs to Christ, and this means that the war is already won. We're just in the space between D-Day and V-E Day in World War II. Where the war is over, still plenty of fighting, still plenty of hardship. But it's inevitable that victory is coming. Every kingdom belongs to Christ. Implication number three, Jesus, in his all authority, could wipe us all out. But because he doesn't, his patience shows his mercy. Because the question is, right, why doesn't he just strike every worldly king down, replace them with his people? It's his mercy. Second Peter chapter 3 says the reason that God delays destroying the earth with fire is because he's patient, wanting you to come to repentance. If you're here this morning and you have not trusted in Jesus, the fact that you're here this morning and didn't die beforehand is his mercy. It's his kindness and his patience. One day, verse 20, the end of the age will come. And he will arrive on a war horse, Revelation 19, to slay his enemies. But that day is not yet. He is patient. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. King Jesus has all authority. He reigns, and the way he fits his church to accomplish his mission shows that. The second reality that it shows is the reality that he is with us. Verse 20, And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. King Jesus makes a promise to his disciples and to us 
that he will be with us. And he can do this because he is risen from the dead. He's not temporarily here and then see you later, but he's risen and seated at the right hand of the Father and has sent his spirit to be with his people. He is with us always. As he sends us out on this impossible mission, he goes with us. He gives us something better than any kind of gadget or any kind of extraordinary person. He gives us his very presence. The all-sovereign all sovereign promises to be with us. And this, the first implication of this, is massive, massive comfort. Jesus with us is a great comfort to his people. This is why he tells the women, do not fear. This is why he tells you and I not to fear. Because he is with us, we will make it. Regardless of what today looks like or tomorrow looks like. Because he is with us, we are protected. Even if we are captured or killed. When the leader of the IMF gives the mission, right, what does he say? If you or a member of your team is captured or killed, the secretary will disavow all knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. What does Jesus say? No, I'll be with you. I will not leave you. I'll be with you to the very end. Because he is with us, second implication he transforms the ordinary means that he gives us. Because, you see, when Jesus is present, the stuff that seems so ordinary is no longer ordinary, right? Remember the, the feeding of the 5,000? You got regular old bread, and when Jesus is there, what happens? It multiplies and feeds a crowd, right? Jesus takes and transforms these ordinary means. When ordinary means become imbued with his power of his spirit, water becomes death and resurrection. Wine becomes the blood of the new covenant. His word becomes a sharp sword that pierces to the heart. Because he is with us, he transforms not just the means, but the people, you and I. Ordinary people become instruments of blessing. In this text, a couple of ordinary women are transformed. Sisters of Eve get to carry the good news that their offspring has crushed the head of the serpent to his disciples. Weak, transformed into messengers. Jesus' presence with us and his proclamation that he has been given all authority, these are the realities that the impossible mission testifies to. As we accomplish his impossible mission through the ordinary means that he's given us, we testify to these realities that he really is with us and he really does have all authority. The church ourselves, itself, the universal church, is proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Augustine himself put it this way, what do we see which they saw not? the church throughout all the nations. What do we not see, which they saw? Christ present in the flesh. Let what we have respectively seen help us. The sight of Christ helped them, the disciples, to believe in the future church. The sight of the church helps us to believe that Christ has risen. That's what's happening here. You want proof of the resurrection? I can't prove it, by saying, here's video evidence. But what I can do, the fact that I can prove, is that for thousands of years, people like you and I have testified that Jesus has risen from the dead. They've staked their lives on it. Could we all be wrong? Sure. But is it, is it more likely that his disciples came and stole the body? And then they're like, but we really want to make sure this keeps going. So we're going we're gonna to take turns being crucified. Who wants to go first? No. It's much more likely that they saw 
Jesus risen from the dead. And then they proclaimed it to others who believed their testimony and others and others on down to you and I if you're in Christ this morning. Jesus used his ordinary people, believing in this extraordinary truth, to transform the world. I mean, think about the fear that the soldiers must have had of Pilate to be able to tell that false story. And a little bit of money allowed them to overcome. And Pilate seems strong, but where is Pilate now? He's gone. Where's the church? She's here. Jesus has persevered his people, not through any kind of magic power, not through extraordinary means, but through ordinary means as his church goes out and obeys him in this impossible mission. Friends, the best stories are not easy wins. The best stories are when against all odds and at all costs, victory is achieved. That is the Easter story, and that is the story that King Jesus is telling through his church. It's a story in which he puts his all authoritiness, his with usness, on display. And Easter itself, Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate it each year, is a reminder of this call to action to be part of that story. The resurrection story, rightly applied, calls you to be part of something bigger than yourself. Something you can't do on your own. Something that is impossible. Apart from the risen and reigning King Jesus. It's a call for you to come and see that this is true. It's a call for you to go and tell others what you've seen. It's a call to make disciples by lived word and sacrament. It's a call to trust King Jesus, who has all authority and is always with you. Let's pray. King Jesus, may we respond rightly to this call. For those that don't know you, Lord, we echo what we already prayed in our liturgy, what we already asked for, that they would come to know you. Lord, may they believe the testimony of those around them who say, no, Jesus is really risen from the dead. And then believing, may they see you. And for those of us that do, Lord, for those of us that know you and trust you, may you use what we have seen here briefly to reinvigorate, re-enliven us to have confidence that these ordinary, weak things that we are engaged in week in and week out are actually your means to build your kingdom and put your resurrection power on display. Lord, give us eyes of faith to see these things and be shaped by them, we pray. Amen. Amen, friends. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. It is remarkable, as we come to the Lord's table, what he does here, which is take ordinary sourdough bread, which could have been toast, and is now the communion loaf instead. He takes something as plain and ordinary as that, and he gives you a little piece of it, and through that little piece, through taking that with your brothers and sisters in Christ in faith, the Lord strengthens your soul. I mean, that's crazy. But that's what he does. That's what he does to show that this little weak thing is actually putting on display his power, right? Christ's power perfected in weakness. And through this wine that could have been, these grapes could have been, in someone's glass as they enjoyed a nice steak, 
But instead, they're right here in this picture, doing the thing that Peter Lightheart says all grapes want to do. These ordinary things, through these things, God is ministering to us. Because it's God doing it and not the things, there is nothing magic in these things. So, if you are not in Christ, this little bit of bread and this little bit of wine will leave you unsatisfied and will not nourish your soul. It's our connection to the king that transforms these ordinary things to do extraordinary things in us with him. And so, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, this meal is for you. If you haven't, that's okay. I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad you get to hear about this this morning. But don't come up and take these elements because they will leave you hungry. Instead, snack on some more food after service. That's okay. And during the moment when you see everybody else who is in Christ coming up here and trusting in Jesus, ask yourself, what do you believe about him? Ask him to make himself known to you. Ask me after service or any of us who come up here and receive, we would love to talk to you about King Jesus and about what it means to know him. For all who do know him, I invite you to receive this meal as a good gift from your Savior who loves you. I'm gonna uh, recite from 1 Corinthians 11. Remind us of the significance of this meal. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, would you pray with me? And we'll give thanks for this meal.